All right. Yeah. All right. We need now to drill deeper on the topics of the day that we will be discussing this morning, especially looking at uh, the economy, where the Kenyan economy lost its job creation momentum for the first time in four years, even as the large numbers of previously employed individuals joined the labor market in, in wake of staff retrenchment that dominated corporate Kenya in 2016. Officials or official data released by the Kenya Bureau of Statistics shows that the economy created 832,900 <coughs> new formal and informal sector jobs in 2016, down from 841,600 a year earlier, or 15.2% drop it was the first time the economy has span fewer jobs in a year since the Jubilee government came to power in 2013. The outcome has pulled President Uhuru Kenyatta's government farther from its target of minting one million jobs a year, as promised in his Jubilee uh, Coalition's 2013 election manifesto. The economy's jobs creation momentum has grown steadily from 750,000 four years ago to nearly 1 million in 2015 before declining to last year's 832,900. Plus, a rapid buildup of public debt in the past four years has put the Kenyan economy at the risk of turbulence. The World Bank has warned, adding its voice to rising concerns over the possible impact of heavy borrowing on the country's future. World Bank Chief Economist for Africa, Albert Zefak, and the bank's lead economist, Punem Chuhan Paul, saying borrowing to finance infrastructure projects should be balanced with the dire risk of overborrowing. Kenya has in the past four years borrowed billions of shillings to finance mega public infrastructure, including the ongoing debt construction of the standard gauge railway line, power generation and road projects. Recent focus indicates that the borrowings could soon take the debt load past 60% of GDP. Kenya's total public debt stood at 3.827 trillion shillings or 51.50% of GDP in December 2016 according to the latest data from the Treasury. And the World Bank uh, the World Bank's warning comes at a time when a mounting debt has dominated public discourse in Kenya and after several think tanks and experts expressed similar sentiments in recent months and of course that has been also topic of our debate Every time we come here on the state of the economy with our <laughs> panelists, and right now there's a new warning. What do you think about this particular new warning? 60% of the GDP. We are teetering on the brink of disaster. Aren't we? Are, are we any, where are we? 60% is the number. Not yet. Not yet. We're at about, what, 51, 52? Close to the 50% mark. So to, <laughs> so to get, that's a pretty big shift, that 800 basis points. For, you know, so the, the, but, but the point I think it's making is that 60% should be uh, a sort of red light, yeah. um, I think. Uh, you know, when the European project happened, the Maastricht criteria for European countries to come into the EU was 60% mm -hmm. debt to GDP. Of course, they went considerably higher. But I think realistically, 60% is a, is, is a threshold, particularly because if you look at the last 24 months, there were many countries that were within that 60% threshold. <coughs> then they had the currency fall out of bed, and suddenly they were at 100 and 110%. So if you want to sort of protect yourself against uh, these sort of serious potential curveballs, I don't think it is sensible to push the dial beyond there. Um, I think we need to look at better sequencing of our projects, so we're not trying to do them all at one go, and, uh, and, and, and look at that sort of curve, um, so you don't get a huge lumpy repayment uh, falling due at, at any one time, and I think we've begun to see that come out of Treasury. Um, people were saying, oh, they borrowed this much, but actually they were ahead of the curve. They were borrowing because they knew an election was coming and that they better get it done sooner rather than later. So, yes, it is an issue. It's been flagged up severally. It, of course, depends on where the money's been spent and how effectively it's been spent. But, you know, I can't argue with the new railway. I can't argue with better roads. I can't argue with more electricity. These are all the ingredients that we need if we want to do and meet the greatest challenge, which is to put people into gainful employment, mm -hmm. so that they've got jobs that they are they're able to uh, work, they're able to work, and they're able to feed their families. 
And I think if we need those, you know, these are the building uh, blocks of a modern economy. Without power, forget industrialization. All right. You know, without a road, forget hit going to the world markets. But you say you can't argue with, uh, with, with the new roads uh, project, the Standard Gauge Railway. But the Jubilee administration, according to the recent Business Daily, uh, shows that uh, the Jubilee, uh, Jubilee falls 68% short of tarmac road targets. Uh, you know, what we're being told on the state of a nation address is diametrically different from the reality on the ground. The total length of tarmac roads extended to 14,500 kilometers by end of 2016, uh, up from 11,300 kilometers in 2013. And this is from the Economic Survey 2017. So we can't argue with that? So well, the, I, the minutia of the detail, I, you know, I haven't been. I know there's has been a very big debate about how many roads have actually been rolled out compared to what we're being told, and somebody's got to go and do that analysis and come back and tell me. But so far, it's been very party political. I found, you know, one side will say they've built anything, the others will say that they've built the world. But I, until I get that hard data and I'm I, able to reconcile it, I can't really opine on that. I think Kip's got us. Yeah, I, I think Deval, you raised a very profound point. I mean, if our leaders have, have, have stated something that isn't correct, then I really think they need to be held account for that. <laughs> and, and I think really the, the, the people, you know, sitting in the National Treasury in the, in the Ministry of Planning really need to come up with the facts. What is the reality on the ground in terms of the number of kilometers of tarmac that we've, we've, we've done? But I won't weigh in um, on the debt situation because especially given the panel that we have today, we have far more seasoned economists than I am. But I would like to just talk about how we've spent the money that's been borrowed. And for me, what concerns me is what portion of it goes into recurrent expenditure. And I, I, I take the view that perhaps we have a gov government that is a bit too bloated. Our leadership cadre is perhaps too um, top heavy and we are remunerating people far too highly and too much money is going into recurrent expenditure. But I have absolutely no quarrel with what's going into the development budget because I do agree with Ali Khan that, uh, I mean, putting money in the railway, in the roads, in ports, in airports, in last mile electricity, and etc., are precursors for real takeoff economically. Mm -hmm. So I'm really, I really want to laud the government for what they've done in terms of infrastructure, mm -hmm. but we really need to keep an eye on the recurrent expenditure. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's hear from... Uh, Michael. Every government has to balance spending for today versus spending for tomorrow, investing for future returns, knowing that when you're deferring uh, expenditure for capital development, you're not able to do so much to get elected next week or next month mm -hmm. or next year. And that is always the challenge in any country in the world. Uh, the temptation to govern your expenditure patterns to the electoral uh, cycle. L last week when I was in Malawi, um, I, I was there mainly for the launch of their parliament's caucus on population and development. So population trends, fertility, all this sort of stuff is a very long-term thing. It's absolutely predictable, but it's long-term. So as we were talking with the MPs there, I was asking them, how are you going to sell this issue of the demographic dividend that would result from lower fertility rates when it isn't going to get you one extra vote. Because equally here, I'm not so sure that the average voter who voted for you or for Sonko or for anyone else is voting in the remotest because of expenditure on roads and, and railways at that individual level. And yet we know that at the macro level, unless that happens, that voter will suffer. So there is this disconnect between the voter and therefore what the politician, how the politician has to appeal to the voter vis-a-vis -vis the long-term growth of the economy and management of debt and creation of jobs. Um, on, on the creation of jobs, yes, it's 2% down. Um, the unfortunate thing is that the economy is still the, a huge proportion of those jobs being generated are informal, difficult to measure exactly, I would guess. Um, and meanwhile, in the formal economy, people are getting leaner and leaner. Everyone all over the world is trying to do more with less. And as we've been hearing earlier on, of course, in some sectors, particularly there's downsizing, never mind uh, uplifting. But foreign direct investment is coming in. Multinationals continue to be attracted. 
they are creating a particular type of job, probably a smaller number of high-level jobs. Um, I was reading an interesting article that we were being sent yesterday from a recent Harvard Business Review about large-scale Chinese investment in manufacturing in Nigeria, mm -hmm. creating thousands of jobs. Mm -hmm. So the question arises, how are we going about attracting Chinese investment here? Surely we should be very attractive in that regard, beyond having the Chinese build infrastructure. This was a large-scale ceramics plant, as it happens, and, 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 and various others. Ethiopia does better at, at actually attracting um, investment. So we do have this capacity to create many manufacturing jobs, not least for export. Um, but it, it's, still, it's still not happening. Mm. If I compare again, I, I keep coming back to this recent experience of mine, Malawi is completely agricultural. They're almost exclusively dependent on tobacco. They're only 18% urbanized. They're right at the other end of the spectrum from us, and it makes us realize here quite how advanced we are, quite how energetic, quite how diversified, quite how appealing. The potential is there. We must get more focused on uh, delivering on that. I think. Oh, I? Yeah. I think that uh, we we over the last ten years or so, or maybe slightly longer, in both the Kibaki administration and the Uhuru administration, we have focused a lot on enablers. I mean, and going back to Vision 2030 and so on. Uh, that because without the enablers, without infrastructure. As Ali is saying, if you don't have the roads, if you don't have railway, if you don't have electricity, for example, you will have no production. So I think we've put quite a bit of effort on that side. And it is my view that, although I'm not saying stop uh, uh, looking at uh, making sure that uh, we connect every, every, there shouldn't be a market center in Kenya today uh, without electricity and so on. Um, but I am saying we need to tilt or to put some more emphasis now on the softer side, meaning what is happening with enterprises, what is happening with small business, what is happening with micro, uh, and so on. Now, I think they, and, and we, we are in a good place to do so, because last year uh, we completed the first really in-depth survey uh, of uh, micro and small businesses in Kenya uh, for, for, for a very long time. Um, and you will notice in this year's economic survey, it is given quite significant treatment. Because, so now we know where are the small businesses in Kenya? What sectors are they in? What are their issues? What, uh, how many jobs are they creating? And so on. And yes, of these 832,000 jobs you're talking about, um, 80% of those jobs are created by the small businesses. So what we hope to see, what we hope, what I certainly hope to see, uh, is a government uh, with our partners, uh, like Gabriel and, and, and the African Development Bank and others, uh, putting now some emphasis on pushing uh, or improving on supporting a small business uh, so that in fact, the investments we've made on the infrastructure side uh, can pay an even higher uh, uh, dividend. And I think uh, to, to finish off on this point of debt, um, and I know that uh, Gabriel and I, uh, we've been on this panel many times to say, look, yes, we are not in danger zone. So fine, one can say slow down, and I think that is a fair comment in terms of uh, the how much debt are we picking up. But we needed to pick up that debt to create the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But you see, once we've built the railway Dibal, we are not going to build another one tomorrow. I mean, we have the standard gauge, so we don't need to borrow nearly right. as much uh, to build another but, one tomorrow. But maybe we need to also to look at the viability of the standard gauge railway itself. But before we even head there, I think you had something to say. We've been there, but we need to look at it one more time. Because I think the, the, the proposal was, you know, the transportation within the East African region. But it seems we'll be having this particular standard gauge railway, just servicing our country. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. and for, for, for another time. Just a moment. Let's hear from Alikan. Sorry, just two quick points, Gabriel. Sorry. Okay, sure, sure. I just wanted to pick up on Kiprono's point about uh, recurrent expenditure. Yes. 
this is, yeah, and take you back to those transactional guys we were describing in the White House. If they looked at our spending in government, they would cut that by half if you are running a business. Let me be honest, half. And you would produce a better outcome. But obviously it's politically unpalatable. But if you think of the situation practically across the continent, I can't think of one example of a country that's getting it right. The majority of countries are overspending on salaries and underspending on development. Mm -hmm. They are unable to shed people, they are un un and so far unable to make that leapfrog about, about which could be made in government. Mm -hmm. So when Trump is speaking about slashing the State Department by 33%, and we're all going, oh my God, how can you do that? His thinking is correctly informed, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to the African continent and how we get to grips with the cost of government. The cost of government being bloated means the political economy is bloated. How much is going to be spent on this election? My estimates show $4 billion. $4 billion is over 5% of our GDP. Where is that money going to come from? You don't have to read fairy tales to work this story out. That's why in places like Mozambique you had a bond scandal. That's why we've had all kinds of things happen. Until we get serious and we can talk about everything that we want to talk about, until we get serious and we decide, immigration department, twice too much, two times bigger. How do we, how do we deal with that? Automate them all. This is the reality that's got to happen because otherwise we're never going to have enough money to do these big projects. We'll always be doing it on an overdraft and the nature of overdrafts is at some point your banker likes to pull it in, especially when it looks as if you can't afford to pay it. That's the reality of it. First point. And then the second point was just about the economy and about jobs. We're in a very disruptive moment, you know, if you look at it anywhere in the world. You look at something like Uber came here in six months time was the biggest taxi company in Kenya, right? This, was, this is not something that's happening over five or ten years. You just open your eyes and the next day it had taken over. So I think from an economy point of view we've also got to be aware that we're in this disruptive moment. The banks, for example, have got to re-engineer re themselves or they're going to die. So it is going to be disrupted, there is going to be lots of noise, but it's a new economy that's coming into sight. The old one needs to work better, of course, but there's also a new one coming into sight, and people should look at that and think, where can I grab an opportunity on that front? Mm -hmm. right. Just come in uh, quickly and touch on one or two issues. On this jobs thing, uh, listen, yeah, we all want numbers, 15%, 15.2, and so on. If you really begin to drill down and look at the quality of jobs. Perhaps, you know, less people employed, but better jobs, uh, high-tech jobs. Uh, yeah, Ethiopia has a very high uh, success in employment, but they're hiring uh, assembly line workers, to, uh, producing garments and so on. Is that the kind of jobs that you want this country to, to, to move forward, to, to look forward to? Uh, if you're going to talk about productivity, is that the kind of job that's going to give you the productivity? I think for me what we should look at is what has this government done to create the environment for industry, for private sector to, to come in and create jobs. Kenya has, in the past two, three years, has jumped by about 40 points this uh, doing business survey, mm -hmm. making it one of the most, the, the most attractive countries to invest in. I think to me, in the medium term, that's the thing to watch. Not how many jobs were created today. Yeah, of course, we have to keep feeding people, but are we putting in place the right foundation, i.e. cost of doing business? Today, you can go to the, what, the Hudomas and register your business in one day. How many countries can claim this? So I think look at it in its broader totality than if we pull out the, the numbers. Uh, the second one, uh, the debt issue. Uh, I know you're going to whip this horse. <laughs> whip with this horse. Look, as everyone has said, don't worry. Uh, you know, Deval, if you, if you really want to know my, my view, first, 
as Ali Khan said, there are instruments in place, including the EAC. Yes. You know, there is a threshold above which GDP to debt cannot exceed, even within the EAC member countries. The ministers of finance meet and they look at each other just like the European uh -huh. Union does. So there are many checks and balances to make sure Kenya doesn't go into the danger zone. But to me, the most important thing is, are we borrowing growth generating uh, loans, uh, resources? Are we borrowing to generate growth? And I think the answer is an unequivocal yes. And in my view, what Kenya needs to do today is not slow down, but continue and make that connection to the small and medium businesses, uh, build that last mile connectivity so that you don't just build big transmission lines, but you connect them now to the household. If you are a hairdresser that needs electricity and you can't work because eight hours of the day there's no power, you need to connect that uh, hairdresser or photocopy shop, bring it down to that last mile to where people live and to, you know, so connect it to things. Uh, yeah, make the connection. This is not the time to stop. This is not the time to change course. This is the time to stay the course and now move it from the hard infrastructure, now connected to people, businesses, and, and, and families. Lastly, on the roads, uh, we finance a lot of roads. Look, you can count this road business 10 different ways. Uh, Again, if you look at what kind of roads are we building? Are we building roads that connect farmers to market? They may be shorter, but they are much more, again, growth generating type of roads. What's the point of building the SGR from Mombasa to Nairobi if you don't connect it to Naivasha? And that's where you're going to put up your industrial <coughs> parks. Uh, and this is a viability we're yeah. asking about the projects themselves, the roads, the connectivity. If at all is not, you know, uh, uh, joining us with the entire East African state where it will make more sense as it is right now. We know the even the domestically though, even domestically, you know, if if Kenya is looking at setting up industrial parks, uh, agro-industrial parks, uh, textile, and so on, this railway needs to go there so that you're not just building railway from point A to point B, but to economic centers. Right. So, you know, but not to worry about it. I'm, 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 looking, I'm looking at the ballot. I'm really, really looking forward to see the manifestos of the Jubilee government and the manifesto of NASA um, that will inform what they will be doing over the next 95 or so days before the elections. And, you know, we should have a session here. I think so. Looking yeah, at those two. Well, uh, yeah. You know, having said that, you know, this last five years, uh, you know, there's been a lot of gains as, as there have been challenges. And one of the things that I want to really highlight is, uh, you know, the economic diplomacy agenda that President Kenyatta uh, led has led to some dividend. I mean, we've seen motor vehicle assembly plants come into town. Uh, we've seen quite a bit of uh, high profile investment uh, going on. We've seen many of the leading brands of the world setting up shop in Kenya. We've seen our service sector expand. Um, I also think that uh, devolution is one of the big ticket items. I mean, really, if you go around this country today, if you look at the hospitality industry, if you look at the availability of goods and services mm -hmm. at the county level, we are, we are miles ahead of our, of our neighboring countries because if you go today, there's a, lo a far better spread of, of development and economic activity in the country. There's another thing that I want to load you belief for is, you know, intra-African trade. I mean, if you, it's 12%. Mm -hmm. We're not trading with each other. We're just talking and we're not really trading with each other. But we in Kenya are at the forefront of saying, look, let's do business with Nigeria. Let's do business with Ethiopia. We're opening our borders. We're saying, let's go to Rwanda. Let's do this and that. And they are ultimately having um, an effect. But where have we failed? I, I think really the biggest failure has been in our inability to tackle corruption, our inability to create a policy environment that is stable, where you can make a business plan knowing that in 10 years' time, the same uh, assumptions that you made will hold true. We are seeing a lot of blackmail from Parliament. I mean, the number of industries, even Safaricom, I mean, a company as big as Safaricom with its uh, governance structures, they are also subject to the same extortionist activities that go on in, in, in Parliament. I mean, it is, I think 
really, if we don't find a way to tackle corruption over these next few years, then we will really be joking. Mm -hmm. and, and also just creating that environment where you can create a business plan, knowing that the environment will be stable enough for you to see your business plan through. But let me just close by talking about SMEs. And Diritu rightly said that actually the bulk of employment creation is taking place at the SME level. But have we been serious in developing that sector? Have we been serious in giving that sector the opportunities they deserve? Have we given them the tools to do business? Yeah, I mean, I think we've had a lot of knee-jerk policy reaction. The banks are charging too much interest. What do we do? Let's cap their interest without looking at the consequence of it denying credit to the SME sector that therefore also denies economic growth uh, from taking place. So I want to say that the SME sector, in my opinion, should be the driving force of the agendas of both these uh, you know, protagonists and antagonists politically. And we are looking as a Chamber of Commerce, we are waiting to see Jubilee's agenda, we are waiting to see NASA's agenda. Mm -hmm. That will then therefore also ask, uh, inform what we as their leaders are going to tell them in terms of who to support. because. Without supporting the SMEs, you're not going to see any employment let grow. And, you know, having said that, many sectors of the economy are going through serious crises. I mean, look at the media. Okay, media, there's an aspect of which technology is taking over a lot of the jobs. Mm -hmm. But look at banking, look at manufacturing. There's a lot of distress, and you see there's a lot of incestuous relationships. I mean, people in media, I mean, are you, you know it, the Bala guy in the nation will probably marry a girl in Radio Africa. Mm -hmm. If there's two retrenchments, what's going to happen to that family? You, cr you create such serious social unrest. So should we should, should cross over to the manufacturing sector. We need to, we so need to actually <laughs> 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 pick, pick your, girl, pick your girls to, carefully. Let him finish. Let, 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 let him finish. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my point is, uh, really, for me, the key focus is two things. One, we need to look at how we can have employment-led growth. And then two, we need to focus on productivity. Our agriculture. In Transoya, we used to produce 30 bags of maize per acre 20 years ago. Today, that average is down to less than 20, it's like 15 or 16 bags an acre. There's no intervention of, of, uh, of extension workers. There's no new technologies that are being put to place. I have friends from Israel who came to Transoya, and I took them around a few counties. And eventually, they came back to Nairobi, and they told me, Kiprona, you guys are not serious. You're not serious. I mean, you're not looking at what you can do with your country. True, true. Thank you. And we have callers who are hanging on the line. We'll come to you uh, in a moment. Thank you. Thank you. We have Otua Sifuna who's hanging on the line with a question or a contribution. Good morning, Otua Sifuna. Yes, Dibal. Good morning. Good morning. Very briefly, sir. Yes, this is Otua Sifuna. Yes. You know, Dibal, I am an average Kenyan. Yes. And when it comes to such topic like uh, the, the, the state of the economy or economic growth, Dibal, I am a, a very, very bitter person when I hear uh, bitter, uh, Terms such as growth, domestic product, mm -hmm. infrastructure or development, the bar, let me tell you, you cannot talk of uh, national economic growth yes. when the average Kenyan is suffering. The bar, if I have to eat Ugali and take a chai before I sleep, I need 800 shillings. Supposing we are 10 of us in the house, we shall need 8,000 shillings the bar. The average life of a Kenyan poor person has become so unbearable such that if a Kenyan wanted to commit suicide in the bar today, he would not afford the price of a rope. We want to talk of a big plan such as the SGR, the infrastructure development. Let us come down to the basic demand. Unga. Milk, bread, that is when the average Kenyan will tell you that the Kenyan economy is growing. People are dying, the man. We can't. And I'm telling you, that what has given you. You go and think it. If you wanted to commit suicide today as a poor, a poor Kenyan, you will not afford the price of a rock. Oh, oh, oh. We shall send the fire brigade there. Otoa Sifuna is on fire. He is on fire. All right, let's, let's hear from Damien from Loi Tok Tok. Hello. Yes. Yes, Damien. You have a question or a contribution? Yes, I would like to contribute just slightly, especially over the economy. Yes, please. When we look at our country, what there is something called the land policy. Mm -hmm. The land policy was supposed to be a part of us to produce our own food. But let me put it this way. In the past um, several years, all the land which can produce 
food has been uh, used for concrete erosion. These are uh, like uh, you go to Kiambu. They are putting off coffee trees to replace with their building. In Loitoto, we are just based on the top part of Mount Kilimanjaro, which is more productive. When this is the arid area, within the areas of America and the like. Some of these upcoming towns and the cities in places of the Capte Plains and the like. And then we produce our own food from the land which are fertile, like the Kiambu and the like. Okay, let's come at the, 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 the issue of SGR. Yes, uh, yeah, kindly be brief, very, uh, very yes, brief, sir. Very brief. Yes, sir. Now, Thank you. when you take five years of conversation with the Chinese, Whatever they'll do for uh, meaning factories and the economy, God knows. Everybody will almost close because these Chinese will now, if they, they have managed to damage something up to this far, what will they do in five years with a free hand with, and with a locomotive which can take their goods right inside to Naivasha? I think you people who are not being serious. And now we are talking about uh, putting all those infrastructure when the, the stomach is empty. I can't imagine when my, uh, my daughter was telling me that she was unable to live in a rock with having you. no water for two good weeks. How? Oh, it's not a very meaning of Thank you. Also now thank you, thank you, Damien. Thank you. And uh, of course, also the reception is not very, very good as well. But uh, we've got the gist of what Damien is saying from Loy Tok Tok as well. But we want to see also what we have from uh, the, our Twitter handle as well. And Usha Jose is going to take us uh, through that as well. Right. So your feedback keeps coming in. Remember, if you haven't got any comment in yet, AM Live and TV is our home on Facebook, on Twitter and on Instagram. So straight to the comments. Uh, our question today was, do you think the unemployment crisis will be over anytime soon? And uh, we have at... Um, at Jacob, who says, I call it, oh, so he's, talk, he's not actually answering the question. This is on the Donald Trump um, caricature. He says, I call it soap opera operated economy of Donnie Trump. Um, we have Bernard Opio who says, no, how can unemployment ease in a country where every employer is giving profit warnings? We have Patrick Cabras, who says unemployment cannot ease as long as the current administration is still in office. Even the cost of applying for a job is high. And finally, we have Paul Karanja, who says unemployment will cease when every county, I think he meant cease with a C, cease when every county will set up industries to process goods they produce. So unfortunately, that's all the time that we had for social media today, but do keep the conversation going. Um, on social media and we will try to reply to as many of your comments and queries as possible. Back to you, Dibar. Right. Thank you very much, Usha. There. Also, Daniel Tay is saying, skewed reports from uh, your desk from government beneficiaries seated right there. They're saying largest economy with the largest unemployment and business closure. Asking a, a, a probing question there. Uh, we wonder if it's skewed because we are reading from the economic uh, survey. Uh, Francis is saying what most people don't realize is that government is not a job creator, it's a job enabler, right? This yeah, is from, from, that's a good point yeah. from, from first. Right, as, as we're winding up now, uh, 500,000, I think uh, before I even go there, we can answer to what Otto Sifuno was, uh, was talking about. You know, as much as we'll be talking here and we, you know, rattle out the numbers, the issue on the ground is the basics. Unga, Maziwa, that's milk, maize flour, and bread on the table, which to Kenyans is not being uh, reflective of what we're talking about. Our economy is robust, is growing by, you know, what, two, two point whatever percentile. To them, they don't realize this. If but, I can but, uh, oh, sorry. But, one, one quick point. If, you, if I can compliment President Moy's government, and that's one of the things I'd compliment them for, is that they understood that, what you've just said. <laughs> The price of food creates revolutions all over the world. Bread riots, we've seen this happen, you know, I think three years ago it was Mozambique with bread riots. So 
you've got to be very, very sensitive to the price of these basic staples. Thank you. We are hungry. We are green. Um, so, and we have a shamba. So what, what, I think the big question is, uh, we need to go, we need to till the shamba. And of course, if we have a tractor, we can till an even bigger shamba to grow food so that ultimately we can be able to not be hungry. So I think those are, those are the, the policy choices, that those are the, the choices that we are talking about. That because our population is increasing, don't we need to have uh, a tractor now so that we can till an even bigger piece of shamba and ensure that we are growing the right crops and so on. So, uh, you know, Mr. Sfuna is putting it as though it is an either or. It is not an either or. We must do things now that ensure tomorrow and the day after and the day after we are not going to go hungry. And, but we must also do things now that ensure that, of course, uh, we will survive today. Because if we don't survive today, then there's no point about tomorrow. And uh, so it is not either or. Uh, on the, on the, on the, in, in the connection between SGR and food is like this. There is no point, uh, or rather, if you, if you import food, if you import maize, for example, and it costs uh, twice as much as you bought it just to move it from, Nairobi, uh, from Mombasa to Nairobi so that somebody uh, in Kiambu or in Thika or, or in, in, in Kibera can, can get unga, yeah, then, in fact, uh, that person is going to go hungry. So the SGR is about transport, is about logistics of moving the food that we are importing to the people so that they get it uh, cheaper. It is also about uh, moving goods that we are producing to our market so that we can find money to buy that unga. Thank you. So it is not an either or. All right, thank you. Maybe we should be giving also our closing remarks. Uh, we begin with you, Mike Eldon. We are strapped for time. And I think we shall continue this discussion uh, next month. Um, we've talked, all of us today and before always, about productivity, about how we use money, about when we borrow to use it for capital development. These things we will keep repeating. It's easier said from a studio floor than when you're in a governor's mm -hmm. seat or at the national level. But I want to pick up on what you were saying, Kip. The development of counties has been extraordinary. These pioneers of county development in among all their challenges and all the mismanagement and everything, they have established county governments and they have led an initialization of development, a reduction of marginalization and so forth. The interesting thing will be how we transit now into the new regime and how people focus, and again I've said this before, on performance management on transparency, accountability, and proper monitoring and evaluation that is results driven. Thank you. Uh, Gabriel. Yeah, let me just uh, throw out something on uh, this debate about UNGA and the price and so on. Uh, of course, every citizen has a right to demand affordable food uh, commodities, basics and so on. but. There's no guarantee that these prices will always remain suppressed. You know, the cost of producing unga, the technology, the fertilizer cost has gone up, rain has not come, whatever, prices will go up. Now, government can intervene, and as Ali Khan was saying, and that's what the Kibaki regime was doing, you intervene, you subsidize, and so on. But that has implication on your tax, because you have to put up more money on your tax. or you're going to have to live with the notion of a higher price unga. But this idea that year on year we expect the price of unga to be suppressed, I think is something that has to be gently Thank you. but challenged. Thank you. Okay. Um, Debal, I, I want to say, you know, for me, the solution is quite simple. It's not nuclear science. It's not anything that is out of our, our ability. People need jobs and people need food. We just need to start with the answer, how do we achieve that as a country? And I think that we in business have a lot of those answers. So let's see a real conversation between the leadership and the business community. We will give them the answers. 
And it's not about paying hundreds of millions of billions of shillings in, in salaries to these multiple layers of people in governance. It's about actually going to where productivity is. And I think if we, I will wait to see the manifestos, and we will also determine who we are going to support based on how serious they are in terms of taking this country forward from a business perspective. Thank you. Okay. I'll just take, go back to that comment, that tweet about enabling. I think that what we have to see is that we have the talent, we have the human capital, other economies have grown from digging things out of the ground, our economy is growing from the people who walk upon that ground, and they are the, they are the equity that we need to unleash. And I think it's really about looking at our economy and saying, how do we unleash everybody that they can create businesses, they can be excited about doing it, they can keep their profits if they make money, and they can create jobs. And I think it's as simple as that. And we've got to cut everything out and just think, how do we put the tools in people's hands to do that? Fortunately, a real game changer was the smartphone, which is now less than $100. Com connects you to the world, you can communicate, you can run your life through it. So, and our people have embraced that, they're young. I think it's about enabling, empowering, and then saying, get on with it. Thank you.